everyone, in this video we're going to revise electrons bonding and structure, intermolecular forces and shapes of molecules using past paper questions on these topics. Now I've put together these past paper questions on these topics and these questions are readily available on the OCR website, the OCR past paper finder it's called, but you can also download this booklet of questions in the link below in the description and we can work through these together or you can have a go by yourselves and then use this video after to mark your answers. So question one, which iron has a different number of electrons from the other three ions? So to do that we need a periodic table and we can look at the little number which tells us the number of electrons and gallium 3 plus will count three backwards. So one, two, three, and it's going to have 28 electrons like nickel. We do the same with the rest. So chloride, Cl1 minus, will have 17 plus one, so 18 electrons. S2 minus also has 18 electrons. Calcium two plus is lost two electrons. So that also has 18. So the correct answer is A. These other three all have 18 electrons and they're called isoelectronic. Iso means same, electronic is to do with electrons, same number of electrons. Seven is about polarity and the shapes of these molecules. So if you're unsure about the shapes, you can draw these starting with dot and cross diagrams and use your periodic table to help you draw those. This one, the boron's got three outer electrons, no lone pairs. So it's going to look like this, with the chlorines around there equally spaced. CCl4, carbon's got four outer electrons, each chlorine is a single bond. It's going to be tetrahedral like that. And then SCl6, we've got the six chlorines equally spaced. So if we were to look at the shapes of the molecules, that one's octahedral, tetrahedral, trigonal planar. And each of these bonds is polar. So we can annotate the dipoles on. And the dipole points towards a more electronegative atom. And in these three molecules, the dipoles are pointing in all different directions because the molecules are symmetrical. And that means the dipoles cancel out. So the molecule might have polar bonds, but the molecule itself isn't polar because the dipoles cancel because of this symmetry. Whereas this one, the oxygen, the lone pairs, these lone electrons are pushing down these bonding pairs like this. This molecule is unsymmetrical, the dipoles don't cancel. So this one A has polar molecules. Question 16, which compound has the smallest bond angle? So I've drawn out the general shapes of these four compounds. I've not drawn the hydrogens on because I'm just trying to get a rough idea. So bromoethane, we can see around these carbons, we've got four bonding pairs of electrons, zero lone pairs. So that's tetrahedral 109.5 degree bond angles. This one, ethanol, we've got tetrahedral around the carbon atoms, because four bonding pairs, zero lone pairs. But around this oxygen, we've got a bond angle of 104.5 degrees. Around here, it's all 109.5 again. And around this one in the alkene, it's 120. So the molecule with the smallest bond angle is ethanol B because of this COH. Next one's about arrangement of electrons. So we have to fill in the total number of electrons in the first three shells. That's 2, 8, 18. And the fourth shell would be 32. Then he wants the maximum number of electrons in each subshell as well. So in the first shell, we've only got an S subshell and there's one orbital in the S subshell, so it can hold two. In the second shell, we've got an S and a P subshell. The S has one orbital, it can hold two. The P subshell has three P orbitals, each 
of which can hold two electrons, so six altogether. And in the third shell, we get a D subshell as well. That's got five orbitals, each which can hold two electrons, so five times two is 10. With this next one, we've got two isotopes of selenium. We find selenium on the periodic table, or in fact, it tells us here, and the little number is 34. That's the number of protons and electrons. So they're going to be the same because if it was a different proton number, it would be a completely different element. If the electrons changed, it would be an ion, which it's not. There's no charges there. The only thing that change in isotopes are neutrons, the number of neutrons. So to work that out, we do the mass number minus the atomic number to get those. Next question's about nickel and gallium. So nickel, that's in the D block. It's here in the middle with the transition metals. Then it's asking us for the electron configuration of gallium, which is over here. So we just write out the electron configuration until it adds to 31, the number of electrons for gallium. Or we can do it an easier way. Um, I've linked one of my previous videos in the description below that explains how to do this properly. But we've got one, two, three, four. So we're in the fourth period, and it's going to end in 4p, because we're in the p block, one because we're one across in the P block. And then we just fill in everything before that. Next, we've got a question about bonding. So defining an ionic bond is the electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. Then we have to do a dot and cross for potassium sulfide. We've got a metal and a non-metal. That means it's going to be ionic. So we need square brackets and charges. We can show the empty outer shell in the potassium or the full, out, um, the full shell underneath, either's fine. And you might have drawn this out twice or you can just put a big two in front, which is probably quicker. That will save you time. Next one, it wants you to draw sulfur difluoride. That's covalent because we've got two non-metals. Fluorine likes to form single bonds, so it looks like this. And you could have made sulfur the crosses and fluorine the dots. It doesn't matter if you've done it the other way around. The thing that matters is the correct number of bonding electrons and the correct number of lone pair electrons on the sulfur. Then it's talking about two different substances, one being a solid and one being a gas at room temperature. And it's asking us to explain this using structure and bonding. So potassium sulfide, that's got a giant ionic lattice structure with strong ionic bonds. So it's going to have a higher melting and boiling point. Whereas sulfur difluoride, it's a simple covalent structure. And when we're talking about melting and boiling points here, it's the weak induced dipole forces, so the London forces, that have to be overcome in order to melt or boil the substance. And we need to say that these forces are between molecules. The next one is asking about SF6. So that's a common example of an octahedral molecule and its bond angles are 90 degrees. So anything with six bonding pairs, zero lone pairs, octahedral 90 degrees. Then it's asking us why it's unreactive. So a common reason for anything to be unreactive is that the bond enthalpy is high or we could say the bonds are strong. We could also say that this molecule is nonpolar. Question nine is about Hund's rule. So that's about how in P orbitals and D orbitals, electrons go in singly first and then they start pairing up. So we've got four elements. You might want to write out the electron configuration to help you. These are each of the three P orbitals in a P subshell. And phosphorus is the one with three singly occupied P orbitals in its P subshell. So the answer is D, phosphorus. Got some more multiple choice. Which compound has the highest boiling point? So we've got ethanol, which has hydrogen bonding into molecular forces, which are the strongest type of force. We've got heptane, so seven carbon chain. Sodium chloride, now that's a giant ionic lattice structure. 
So this one is the one with the highest boiling point because it's got a lot of strong ionic bonds that need to be broken in order to boil the substance. Next question is about electronegativity. It's asking which bond has the correct polarity. So it's asking which of these has delta plus and delta minus in the right place. Now the element that takes the delta minus, the partial negative charge, should be the one with the highest electronegativity. So here, chlorine's got a higher electronegativity than bromine. These are the wrong way around. Same here, chlorine should be delta minus. Fluorine is the most electronegative element, so it should be delta minus. This is the only one that's correct. This next question, we've got a graph showing melting points across period three. The question's asking us about phosphorus and chlorine and to explain the difference in melting point. Now, if you look here, phosphorus and chlorine Phosphorus is a bigger molecule. There's four phosphorus atoms, whereas in chlorine, there's just two chlorine atoms. So our answer is based on that and number of electrons. So we're going to say phosphorus is a larger molecule than chlorine. Therefore, it has more electrons than chlorine. This means we have bigger or stronger induced dipoles or stronger London forces. So more energy is required to overcome these forces in phosphorus. The next question is about magnesium and silicon. They're both types of giant structure and it's asking us to describe the bonding and include names of particles and forces. So magnesium is a giant metallic structure with metallic bonds and we have to say what these bonds are between. So something like positive metal ions or magnesium two plus ions and delocalized electrons. Whereas silicon is a giant covalent structure with strong covalent bonds between silicon atoms. Next one is a balancing equation question. Aluminium sulfide reacts with water to form aluminium hydroxide and hydrogen sulfide. So it's checking our knowledge of formulae and our ability to balance equations. So we've got the aluminium sulfide here, reacts with water, so plus H2O. We're forming aluminium hydroxide, so that's the formula of this, and hydrogen sulfide, which it gives us. Next thing is to balance. So I've balanced the aluminiums first. Since there's a two in this formula, I just stuck a two in front of the aluminium hydroxide. Next, I looked at the sulfurs. There's a three in this formula, so I stuck a three in front of this with the sulfur on it. Then I counted the hydrogens, and then I counted the oxygens to check. This next one I've labelled as an extension question because I took it out of a unified chemistry paper, which is the A2 one or the A level one. So it's AS knowledge, but it's applied to unfamiliar examples. So I thought this is a good one to include as an extension. We've got three different amines here and we don't really look at amines in AS. And it's asking us to explain the difference in boiling point. So at a glance, We've learned about something similar when we did hydrocarbons. We can see the difference between them is branching. And we know the effect of branching on boiling point in alkanes, and it's very similar for amines. So there's four marks that we can get. So we need to give four points. The first thing to pick out is that this one is a straight chain unbranched amine and that means it has more points of surface contact between molecules so it's exactly the same explanation as for hydrocarbons. This means the molecules can pack more closely and the London forces will be stronger. Whereas these two are branched so they can't pack as closely and they'll have weaker London forces. However, since they're amines, the nitrogen is a highly electronegative atom with a lone pair. It has a neighbouring hydrogen. Well, these two do. That means these two are capable of forming hydrogen bonding interactions. This one isn't. It doesn't have a neighbouring hydrogen atom. These are methyl groups. It has neighbouring carbons, but not a neighbouring hydrogen. So the next thing we talk about is that these two can form hydrogen bonding interactions. 
this can't because it doesn't have a neighbouring hydrogen. Therefore, more energy is needed to overcome the forces in this molecule compared to the others. And we mentioned that hydrogen bonds are stronger than London forces. Last question is about shapes of molecules. So these molecules might be unfamiliar to AS, but we're applying AS knowledge to work out the shapes and the angles. So we have a carboxylic acid and it's asking us, we've got three bonding regions. We can see they're equally spaced. So the bond angle is going to be 120 and trigonal planar. Three bonding regions and no lone pairs. This one, it's asking about the bond angle around the oxygen. We can see that's non-linear, just like water. So the angle is going to be 104.5, or it allows 105, and it's non-linear.